let's it's one minute after 8 30 let's get started everyone is here um Good evening, everyone. My name is Eileen Rin, and on behalf of the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, I'd like to welcome you to this commemorative Torah study. Today, we honor the lives lost and the people affected by the attack on the three congregations, Dor Hadash, New Light, and Tree of Life, or Lesimcha, on October 27th, 2018, the 18th of Hefshan, 5779. Our Torah study today is dedicated in memory of the 11 people who perished on this day two years ago. Please rise if you are able as we recite their names. Joyce Feinberg, Edit Baltya Bat Abba Menachem Vehenka, Richard Gottfried, Yosef Ben Chaim, Rose Malinger, Razel Bat Avraham, Jerry Rabinowitz, Yehuda Ben Yeheskel Veselma, Cecil Rosenthal, Cecil Chaim Ben Eliazar, David Rosenthal, David Ben Eliazar, Bernice Simon, Balia Rachel Bat Moshe, Sylvan Simon, Zalman Shachna Ben Menachem Mendel, Daniel Stein, Daniel Avraham Ben Baruch, Melvin Wax, Moshe Gadol Ben Yosef, and Irving Younger, Yitza Chaim Ben Menachem. May their memories be a blessing. You may be seated. Before I invite Rabbi Doris Dine to say a few words, I'd like to ask you all to honor the wishes of the families of the victims by not engaging in political conversation this evening. Announcements and comments should be exchanged only through private one-on-one -on -one chat and not to everyone or the presenters. And now, Rabbi Doris Dine of Congregation Dor Hadash, please introduce our scholar, Rabbi Deborah Waxman. Thank you, Eileen. The first woman rabbi to head a Jewish congregational union and a Jewish cemetery, Jewish seminary. Seminary. <laughs> where my head is. Sorry about that. Rabbi De uh, Deborah Waxman, PhD, became president of Reconstructing Judaism in 2014. Since then, she has drawn on her training as a rabbi and a historian to be the Reconstructionist movement's leading voice in the public square. Rabbi Waxman is the host of Hashivenu, a podcast about the Jewish approach to re resilience. I had the pleasure of getting to know Rabbi Waxman during my years as a rabbinical student not so long ago at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. I found her to be a person of wisdom, insightful learning, and great compassion. At Dor Hadash, we were touched by her decision to travel immediately out to Pittsburgh from Philadelphia the day after the shooting in 2018 in order to support our congregation. In September of 2019, Rabbi Waxman returned to Pittsburgh to be with Dor Hadash for Shabbat services, and most importantly, in a way, to lead a meditative healing circle for comfort. So I'm especially honored to welcome Rabbi Waxman now as one of the featured Torah scholars for this second year commemoration. She will be sharing her thoughts with us on drawing on Jewish wisdom and practice to cultivate resilience. So welcome, Rabbi Waxman. 
Thank you, Doris. Thank you so much, Rabbi Diane. Um, it is such an honor to be here with all of you. And when I was asked by the members of Dor Hadash and by the president, Anna Kufel, to, um, to, to teach uh, in, in this um, extraordinary tribute uh, in, in memory of the, of the people who were killed. And, and, um, and I, I think a lot, I think very frequently back to that day um, on October 28th, when I came to be um, the, with, with the community. And De I see Debbie Cherry's on this uh, Zoom. She guided me a lot that day and, and until, until I was able to connect with Ellen, who was so immersed in, 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 um, in, in so much work. And you know, we were keenly aware that being the only reconstructionist community in Pittsburgh, that it was a lonely, it's a, it can be a, it can be a, a lonely uh, um, existence. And so to bring, to bring the, the good wishes from across the reconstructionist movement across North America. And, and last year, when, when, when I returned with our board chair, Seth Rosen, after that visit, we wrote an op-ed together um, about how Dor Hadash is a, a model of reconstructionism in its empowered lay leadership that partners with rabbis and educators to create the Jewish community, like other reconstructionist con congregations, to create the Jewish community in which we want to live, the one that we want to pass on to the next generation. So it's, it's a blessing for me to be with you uh, uh, today. It's a blessing for me at all times to be the leader of the reconstructionist movement in our work together across the Reconstructionist movement, when I talk about what the organization I head, Reconstructing Judaism does, I tend to talk about four things. Um, I, we, one of the things that we do is that we train moral leaders from a progressive perspective, moral leaders like Rabbi Doris Dayan. We provide support and resources and we are a central address for communities that are affiliated with the Reconstructionist movement like Dor Hadash, and we aim to support all of them as well as we possibly can in times of celebration and in times of crisis. And we represent a reconstructionist perspective in the public square. Some of that is about doing innovation work um, and creating new expressions of being Jewish. Some of that is through our movement-wide initiatives like an, an, an Israel commission or a Tikkun Olam commission that members of the reconstructionist movement co-create with Reconstructionist rabbis. Some of that is about writing and teaching and sitting at different leadership tables or, or composing op-eds. Um, in, in December of 2016, I added in a fourth descriptor of the work that Reconstructing Judaism do, does, which is that we use, we draw on Jewish wisdom, Jewish practice, Jewish learning to cultivate uh, resilience. I think the timing of when that kind of coalesced, that that was a central activity that we did is not uh, a coincidence. It's the work that, I've, that I and others across the, the organization have really poured ourselves into over these last several years. It served us well over these last several years. It was an orientation that served us very well um, after, after the shooting in Pittsburgh. Um, it is, it's an orientation that is very useful at this moment, which is full of a lot of um, uncertainty, a lot of what isn't known. And, I, and, and, and as, as Doris mentioned, for me, part of the exploration has been through a podcast called Hashi Venu, Jewish Teachings on Resilience. And I'm going to be drawing in part from some of my learning about uh, out of, out of the, the opportunity over the last three years to interview more than 40 rabbis and activists and teachers, mostly Jewish, occasionally from other traditions as well, about how to draw on religious practice, Jewish practice to cultivate resilience. So what, here's what's gonna happen tonight. So I'm gonna do a little bit unpacking, a little bit of a framing about what do I mean when I talk about a Jewish approach to resilience, using resilience to enter into Judaism. And then we're gonna go into breakout rooms and I'm gonna invite you to draw on Jewish wisdom to develop your own uh, 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 re resilience practice. And the la very last bit is we will come back together and do a tiny bit of sharing. And I'm gonna keep my eye on time to make certain we have enough time to do all of that. So uh, let me do the framing first and then I'll coach you through uh, resources as we go into the breakout rooms. You'll be in groups of about four or five. So there's this question, you know, that that that, that leaders get asked. That's something you might get asked that, uh, often of how have the Jewish people survived over millennia, um, and and it's uh, and I think that when I when I'm asked that question, 
the more I th I've come to th thought about it, the more I've come to the conclusion that resilience is, is it one, one answer, um, that, that there is a capacity for resilience that is literally woven into the fabric of Judaism over thousands of years. And that has helped to perpetuate both the tradition and the people who, 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 who take hold of that tradition. So as a reconstructionist, as a general rule, I tend to resist questions about the essence of Judaism. Reconstructionism understands Judaism to be the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. And that definition kind of pushes toward a very dynamic understanding, that core commitment to, uh, to recognizing the central role of evolution and change in Jewish life pushes toward dynamism rather than any kind of fixed or essential understanding. That said, there are, I would think, I think two things that are continuous across Jewish life. One is the Jewish people in all of our diversity and, and in, in our perpetuation. And the other is that change. And, and, and it is, I think, the resili some resilience that allows for, for renewal again and again, rather than just for those things to kind of come to a dead end and, and die out. And so here I'm talking about resilience as, as I said earlier, an orientation, as an attitude, as a process that kind of infuses. So I'm using a fairly technical um, understanding of resilience. I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a word that's used a lot. Um, and I'm drawing from the American Psychological Association's definition um, as resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, and even significant sources of stress. And there's a psychiatrist from, from Yale University, George Vallat, who, who, who uses a metaphor that I find really helpful, that you can think of resilience as a twig with a fresh green living core that when it encounters pressure can spring back and can continue to grow. So I put to you that Judaism writ large is all about resilience. Across the span of Jewish history, Jews have experienced extensive trauma, even catastrophe, and we have survived as a people and as a civilization. After each catastrophe, the prevailing paradigm was inoperable. We no longer understood, we no longer knew how to understand ourselves in relation to God, to other Jews, and to other peoples. And throughout our history, Jews have ultimately transcended catastrophe after catastrophe. We have repeatedly breathed new life into the Jewish people and the Jewish civilization, and we have found pathways toward repair. From trauma, we have had to heal. We have had to recover and revision, recede and regenerate vital Jewish life. And we have found ways to do this both to cultivate resilience, both individually and collectively. So I'm gonna spend just a minute or two reflecting a little bit on the collective piece and then the individual piece, just so, to kind of break, drive the point home. You look at Jewish history, you, one way to see it is as a recurring cycle of crisis and then renewal. There's near destruction and then survival. And then ultimately in many places there's thriving. So just I'll give you just two quick examples. The second temple in Jerusalem was, was the center of religious life in biblical times, and it was destroyed in the year 70 of the Common Era. It was called a horban, a destruction, like that's the edge of a sword. And this catastrophe could have meant the end of the Judean people and of the Israelite religion. But instead, our ancient sages created rabbinic Judaism which was organized not around the temple, but around synagogues and home observance and was promoted through the prism of halakha, which was newly created. Another example, let's leap ahead 1400 years to the Spanish Inquisition. The Sephardi Jews were persecuted terribly. They were expelled. One response was that Jewish mystics fashioned the deep and complex and ongoing to this day tradition of Kabbalah. 
So I could keep going. I could pick out many, many more examples. Um, and all of these are simplifications. I'm giving you two or three sentences. These developments are far more complex. There were downsides and negatives. That this is a very brief summary. But they also suggest, you know, that 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 there is this this the seed of creativity, and they are just a handful of many many examples of how after profound trauma there has been collective Jewish revival. Let me pivot to the individual now. And that's hard in Judaism, separating the collective from the individual, it's difficult because they, they, they really, we see them as so interdependent from a Jewish perspective. And this much is clear. Judaism has sustained the Jewish people because Judaism sustains individuals. That collective is actually made up of each and all of us with our individual hurts and our individual aspirations. And we know, we see how many parents have buried children and are able to continue to work to build a better world. How many people have seen their lives destroyed and found the will to start all over again? All of you who are based in Pittsburgh, you've encountered evil and destruction and you have persevered and found ways to continue these last two years. So it's not unique to Judaism, yet I think within it, there is a cultural capacity for renewal that is built on a foundation of individual practices that encourage and even command renewal. We see it in our liturgy. The morning liturgy teaches Every day creation is renewed, that blessing says. If we open ourselves up to this teaching, we can see that every day, even the hardest days, we have an opportunity to recommit ourselves to living out our values. Another example in the Talmud, in Menachot 43b, there is a teaching that we should say 100 blessings a day. When I was a child and learned about this, I saw this mandate as legalistic, as oppressive. Who, who wants to be that constrained? As an adult, I've come to see it as an invitation to engage in an ongoing gratitude practice, one that raises up the interconnectivity and the abundance that undergirds our daily lives on the best of days, and that is there, some, even if it's obscured, on those, when those days are filled with challenge and with loss. And Jewish time is structured to end each week with Shabbat, literally a seizing of activity. If we truly pause and rest, if we are able to disconnect and unplug, Shabbat can help us to step out of the demands and the preoccupations of the week and can support us in refreshing both our bodies and our souls. And of course, the cycle of the Jewish New Year, of the Jewish year, builds toward the Yamim Noraim, which we just completed, the holidays, when we at once reset the year and through the work of tshuva, of repentance, we reset the moral compass of our lives. So I've been talking about resilience, um, using this psychological term and giving, drawing on Jewish wisdom and talking about a Jewish raison d'etre. Um, and so I've been trying to marry both religion and social science. I hope that the examples that I've given are educational and useful and illuminating, but I wanna be transparent about what I'm doing here. I'm also introducing another source of authority because one hallmark of this modern or even postmodern time that we live in is that it's a time of contested authority. For our ancestors, they lived in a Jewish world that was informed by revealed religion with a supernatural God who, who revealed the, 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 the commandments at Sinai and that, 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 that gave them a clear sense of, 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 of who they were and what they had to do. For us, religion competes with rationalism and we frequently look to science or other explanation for why the world is the way it is and what we should do while we are here on this earth. So it opens up a question of how do we make decisions about ultimate issues? 
for our ancestors, for my buddy even, the answer was because God said so, or maybe it was because the rabbi said so. But since the beginning of the modern era, about 400 years ago, and with, with ever you know, speeding up intensity, increasingly the answers are either because science said so or because I said so. Individual autonomy is a really important principle. The, it, for, for liberal Jews, the reform movement was founded and established on that principle. So what I'm putting forward in this conversation is one, you know, I'm drawing, I'm pointing to the Jewish tradition and saying Jewish civilization offers up rich resources to cultivate religious resilience. But I'm also bringing forward another authority and drawing from psychology to, to say, oh, look, psychology validates these long standing religious practices that cultivate resilience and well being. So what I'm trying to do is rather than uh, perpetuate a competition, I'm looking to, to, to create a harmonization between religion and social science. And I'm doing this because I deeply believe that the stakes are really high and that we are really well served by discerning how we make decisions and, and how we build ourselves up and bolster ourselves. It is a little bit more than 70 years after the end of the Holocaust, which is, one of the major catastrophes of our time. Um, and in Jewish tradition, 70 years is a lifetime. So we Jews who live here in America, we have a, um, a degree of comfort, a degree of um, security that, 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 that maybe is, is unprecedented. And that's part of what we're struggling with today in general, uh, over the last couple of years in the aftermath uh, of, of, of what happened two years ago in Pittsburgh is how much is, is, this, is, is continuous and how much is discontinuous. We're, we're trying to figure out where we are in this narrative. And I think it's really important for us to remember how much comfort and access we have here at, in this open society, in this age of invitation of all the many, many, many different ways of being Jewish or not being Jewish at all. Um, and, and, and for sure, the the pandemic has cracked everything open. And there's a lot of questions and people are turning to religious institutions to help find meaning and to understand so that we, we don't have to do things on our own. And that's informed by this tremendous uncertainty um, and, and, not, and, and not knowing what comes next on the far side of this pandemic, what, what, what things are gonna look like and what we can take for granted. And of course, all the uncertainty about the, this election season that hasn't resolved itself yet. So as I said at the beginning of my talk, resilience, I think, is uh, this, this attitude of resilience is useful in facing challenges and opportunities, which even the positives can be disruptive. They can, they can alter the, the way things are. And, and, and adopting the stance of resilience can help us answer, begin to answer questions like, what are we going to build up? What ideas are we going to embrace and advance? What steps are we gonna to take to thrive? Something I spend so much of my time thinking is how can we make the case that non-fundamentalist religion matters? How can we work so that religion helps us in working for redemption for all people? How can we unleash the deep wisdom embedded in Judaism to provide the sustenance and support to sustain us in these challenging times. And perhaps the most urgent question that sometimes is far away from us and sometimes as, as you folks in Pittsburgh know too well, we see that there are people who are willing to kill and to die for what they believe in. What are we willing to live for? So this is why I'm so entranced by and committed to use drawing on resilience as a potential frame for us. And what I want to do is turn you into uh, you know, breakout groups now to invite you to, to talk about a daily gratitude practice. And I've worked through a whole host of different practices. The one that I brought to you today is um, I think probably the most important to me. Um, and it's about gratitude. Um, and um, and about working on a daily gratitude practice. 
And this sits at the intersection of traditional Jewish practice, and I'll explain that for a second, and contemporary psychology. And the, one of the reasons I also chose it is because what I'm offering up is also supported by technology. Um, uh, so I wanna invite you to look, work your way through Moda'ani, which is the first blessing that we are commanded to say upon waking. For many of us, we encounter it in our prayer book in a, in a morning service, a shachari, but that's its traditional provenance that you say it early up upon waking. Um, and you're supposed to say it no matter what's going on, even when it's hard, hardest and possibly feel so remote from gratitude. And that this actually maps on to um, the research that suggests the, the psychological research that suggests that gratitude doesn't come naturally to us and that it can be cultivated. And that for those of us, if you if we engage in a gratitude practice um, and cultivate that attitude of gratitude, as they say, there are concrete results that people tend to feel more physically healthy, that folks who, who are more who, who are oriented toward gratitude have greater access to their, their orientation toward optimism, that overall they tend to feel better about their lives, more alert and energetic, and more likely to accomplish personal goals. So I, what I want to do, I'm going to share my screen briefly, and you'll have this um, handout. Um, actually, I should I do it this way. Um, oh, uh, Eileen, can you re-enable my, my screen sharing? It was on earlier when I first came on. Sure, sorry. OK. Um, um, so what I, I can share it. I have it up. Oh, you got it. That's great. Um, um, what I've done is brought a whole host of translations of this one line of, um, of the traditional uh, liturgy. Because for many people, oh no, traditional liturgy. They don't want to have anything to do with it. That might be because they're intimidated by Hebrew. That might be because folks are put off by God, traditional God language, uh, conceptions of God. Um, I learned recently how to make it bigger. It, 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 it's okay if, if you can't see it so much because you're going to have this access to it when you go into your breakout groups. Um, we're, going, we're going to put a link into the chat for you. Um, and so I was really, really interested in, in different ways of um, translating it. But this came out because I, I, I try to do a daily gratitude practice. I use an app, and there's a link to it um, on, uh, later on in this document by Rabbi Shefa Gold, another someone with ties in both the Reconstructionist and the Renewal Movement. She has a, an app called Flavors of Gratefulness that have has about 60 different melodies to Moda Ani. And my wife and I were saying it every single day. And one day she said to me, what do you mean when you say this? And I knew she was not asking, what do the words mean? Give me a translation. She was asking, what's the interpretation? What, what really resonates very powerfully with you? And it took me about three or four days to parse every word, every phrase of this one line to come up with a translation that worked for me. So I share that with you in the document. And I also share a couple of paragraphs if, if the God concept is hard for you about a reconstructionist approach to God, which is not, not so much an, an interpersonal, an, a personal God, but more of God as the, the source of, of, of the grounding being of the universe and the source of renewal and, and creation. Um, and my invitation to you is for you to work through either a translation of this blessing that works for you and or to develop if the liturgy doesn't work for you, is there a language that would work for you to recite as a mantra for a gratitude practice? So it's um, it's nine o'clock and I'm gonna ask um, Eileen to, I'm so grateful for her help and her support here. And I'm gonna ask her um, to break you into groups of four or five. And if you take the next 15, the next, uh, 15 minutes to, to kind of, um, we're going to put the link to the resource into the chat. Do you have that, Eileen, or do you want me to drop it? Yeah, in? I was going to put it into, I can sort of globally populate all the chat rooms. I That's think. fantastic. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I think you're, I see, looks like um, everyone who's coming back has come back. I think the technology failed. I'm terribly sorry for that. Um, Eileen's put it up. So if you want to download it now, and take a look at it afterwards. And from the couple of breakout groups that I was in, I'm really sorry that 
the group that where I got pulled out, um, like right as I was 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 about to speak. I but Anne, you were you were um, evincing gratitude, gratitude and enacting gratitude so powerfully. Lisa says that you cannot access it on the server. Um, Maybe we can email it to the participants after. I'm so I'm so sorry. We checked it out and and yeah. and, it, and it didn't work. Um, sorry. Uh, so um thanks so much for, thanks so much for your resilience um it's possible if you say if you click on the chat and say save chat it'll download it onto your computer and then you can go to it and get the link there okay and uh, you know and the other thing that i can do um very quickly is uh, we'll see um if it's i have it saved in dropbox and it is um possible that i can let me just see if this makes a difference. Share, uh, create link, copy link. Um, okay, it is possible that you can access it through Dropbox where you couldn't access it. This might, this might work. Try it. everyone, I just tried, I just sent it again. Maybe that works. Um, so, so this is the thing. Technology is so fantastic when it works, and it's so terrible when it doesn't work. So let us let us not get consumed by the technology, and let us um, focus in on on the whole point, which is that um, that we you know the the goal is that we may we all find ways to cultivate resilience. It's, from what I heard, many of you have such resilience practices, either from the traditional liturgy or things that you have generated on your own. May we all find ways to act in the ways that we need to act. May we all find much support from each other across Zoom, through the telephone, when we're able to be face to face together. And may we find meaning and connection. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you so much for your flexibility as things went differently than we planned. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you to Rabbi Debbie Waxman for teaching us. And thank you to all the participa participants um, as well. And I, I hope that you all have access to the document uh, one way or another. And um, we would like to close this evening with um, Kiddush De, uh, Rabbanit, led by um, Rabbi Doris Dyne, um, a survivor of the attack. Um, I am about to post a link to the text in the chat. So once I do, uh, Rabbi, you can go ahead. I invite you to stand if you can. Hadish to Rabbanan is a prayer in honor and memory of our teachers and all of the 11 people that we lost in different ways were our teachers and continue to be. Vikadal vikadash shame rabba. Yalma divra hirute, the amlich malhute, Bechayechon, uvyomechon, uvchaye de hol bait Israel, Bagala uvizman kari vimru, amen. Yehe Shemei Rabba Mavorach Leolam Olome Omaya Yit Barach Vishtavach, Viet Paar, Viet Romam, Viet Nase, Viet Hadar, Viet Alev, Viet Halal, Shemei de Kudsha Brifu Leela Min Kol Birchata Vishirata, Tushbachata Venechemata, Damiran Bi Alma Vimru, Amen. Al Yisrael, Bi Al Rabbanan, Bi Al Tamidehon. We are called Tamide Tamidehon. We are called Mandas Teen Bioraita. Viviatra had Dame Bidi Vachol Atarva Atar. Yehe Lohon Ulohon Shlama Rabba. Kina Vachista Varachamin. Vachayan Arihin. Muzona Ravicha. Ufurkana mean Kodam of a Hondi Vishmaeva Ara. Vimru. Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba mean Shumaya. Bechayim tovim alenu vial kol Yisrael vimru. Amen. O se shalom vim romav, hu barachamav ya se shalom alenu vial kol Yisrael vial kol yoshvei tevel vimru. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Okay. okay, that concludes our session for this evening. Thank you all, all for joining and uh, have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>